But before we get there, make sure you do yourself a favor. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button down at the bottom of the screen if you are watching us on YouTube, if you're listening on Pandora, Apple Music, Amazon Podcasts, Spotify, any of the above. The Charles Coleman Podcast, this is the new home for black brilliance. We're not just outside. We're not just all the way up. We're in hyperspace. So come get with us. Make sure you are liked. Make sure you are subscribed and make sure you are sharing what it is that we got going on. So our main conversation today, um, I'm very excited to have this with both of you guys because for those of you who don't know, we are running a triangle offense, but we are running the bison beatdown today. This is the bison bully Yes. On the couch that we got going. We got three bison on the couch. Three, mm-hmm. not just HBCU people, not just African-American <laughs> college graduates, <laughs> right? We, we've got we got three Howard University folks on the couch. So, and I love the jacket, by the way. Thank you. For those Thank of you. y'all who are, not, who are not watching the show, but who are listening, again, you're doing yourself a disservice because CEO is right on code today with the jacket for today's conversation. There's been so much in the news about HBCUs. Like if you remember during the pandemic, it was almost like America rediscovered HBCUs. Yeah, it was a little corny. Mm -hmm. I get it. It was a lot of like, oh my gosh, let's support historically black colleges. Pandering. Yeah, it was a lot of like, these Negroes have schools to go to. Oh, wow. Right. Right. So there was a lot of like rediscovery of HBCUs, obviously, which have been there We've been there. We've been outside. Mm-hmm. But now... Mostly by other Negroes, though. That part. Yeah. That part. Yeah. We, and you it's can discuss that. But now there is another sort of wave that has hit on the heels of that sort of self-discovery and in, in America's racial reckoning, which was tethered to this conversation about HBCUs. There is dirty laundry that is being exposed. Yes. And a lot of it is coming from the area of athletics and sort of infrastructure and conversation about sort of what HBCUs do to manage their money, to manage their campuses, to manage their facilities, to manage everything that they have. And there are all kinds of different opinions from different areas. You get people who ain't set foot on an HBCU campus who got everything to say about everything. Mm -hmm. You get some HBCU alums who are like, you know, well, it's about time that this stuff get aired out. And then you get some people who are like, yo, stop airing out dirty laundry, particularly if you ain't really, really part of being on the inside. Mm -hmm. So as three people who are in that universe, connected to that space, who've been following this conversation from all different angles, I really wanted to talk about like, is it a good thing when our HBCUs get aired out? Personally, I think that there is a certain demographic of the culture, black culture, that likes to just critique black people okay. about everything. Mm-hmm. I mean, there is a criticism, a critique, an analysis about everything. It doesn't matter what it is. Specifically about Think Asian, peace, Negroes. Always, but can't think, but peacing. <laughs> See what I'm saying? A lot right. of peacing, Not little, little thinking. thinking. Yeah. You're right. See okay. what I'm saying? So for me... That is something that I am desensitized to, is always listening to what someone has to say. Because first of all, I'm a person who I pay. I send my money back to the institution because I can vouch for what it has done for me in my life. You can say the institution. I do. Could you say like not, the not, university? Not that institution, but I, you know. Yeah, I get Ohio it. Ohio Learning, yeah. Howard University. Yeah. We'll speak. Alma mater. Like, we can say that. Yes. We yeah, can say yeah. Howard. I, I'm trying to, you know, make sure I'm not, but we can say that here. Okay. Um, but we're always talking to people who have no nothing to contribute. But nothing, criticism. But but the, but criticism. That's all they have. There's never a solution. There's never any work that they're willing to do. But they can always point out that work part. What the problem is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the main issue for me. The other issue is I can totally remember summers as an intern coming to New York to some of those other 150 plus year old institutions. And realizing how quickly I was ready to get back down <laughs> to my HBCU right. because there were rats and roaches and hot dog water permeating. The pipes were bursting. It was p- clogs in the bathroom. I mean, all of these things. It's a 150-year-old building. Right, right. It's going to have issues. I mean, I grew up in a historic home. My parents were constantly having to do something mm. without money. That's impossible. These schools are running on like 
gas and fuels. And but but there's tons of complaints. And I feel like every time someone And they can't even manage their own house, let you, alone There you go. Now yeah. that's the thing. And the other thing about these people is if you had taken these little kids who get on the internet and complain about this school that they're now at, if you taken them over their grandmother's house or their cousin's house, they would recognize that like, you know, some people have roaches. So what do you what, <laughs> what so what do you think when you see that? Because that's another thing that's different from when we were in school. It wasn't necessarily that the conditions were significantly worse or better. In fact, I think we understood, for example, that we weren't entitled to a dorm room that was hardwired for Wi-Fi. We right. weren't entitled to, you know, brand new central AC. Mm -hmm. But that was a function of the time. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of understand that. But now one thing that I've seen recently is that the kids, the students, the people on campus, young people mm -hmm. will air out the university in a way that just has no regard for anything. Do you think, yay for these students for using their voice or like, yo, this is not the way to do that? Well, first of all, students... Um, at any institution, particularly black schools, using their voices, not only for what's going on outside of the campus, but what's going on on the campus is not new. Like, it's always been a protest in front of the A building. Yeah, okay. It's yeah. usually about administrative stuff, less yeah. about, like, maintenance and sanitation, right? Um, so I find it um, interesting. It, it's never, this discussion is never black and white, right? So I find it very interesting that, um, that these are the issues that are being highlighted when they've always existed. I mean, you were at Howard a, a, a year or two before me. We mm. were at Howard at the same time. So we've pretty much shared the same experiences. There's always been something, right? But we were so just excited and happy to be on this campus, this illustrious university. And and I'm yes, we're speaking for Howard, but I'm sure other HBCUs can say the same yeah. thing, right? Yeah. And we look at what these universities have done in spite of the conditions for these students. Like, I'm not about to like raise hell about this. Do I want better, uh, a better environment? Yes. But this is the same environment for us to speak, you know, particularly that produced a Thurgood Marshall. This is, this, you know, so I don't like, it's, it's, I get it because nobody wants to live like in squalor. Like right. if you see what's going on in the airing out Jackson state with all like the whatever, but to her point, these buildings are old. Like some things are just gonna get missed. Do you yeah. do you do you feel differently when it is, for example, from someone who is in the athletic context when they could potentially attract money? Because the argument, for example, and I ain't trying to air nobody out necessarily, but there's been conversation about Ed Reed at Bethune Cookman mm -hmm. and then Prime situation at Jackson State. Mm -hmm. Neither of them went to HBCUs. Right. Ed Reed went to University of Miami. Prime went to Florida State. State. Right. And some people have said, well, these are people who, through their work and their efforts, could actually be bringing dollars in. And so we need to listen to them, or we need to allow them to have a voice. Or when they express it publicly, it's just in the HBCU's best interest to a to appreciate that criticism mm -hmm. because on the other side of that, if you address it, are dollars. And then there are other people who are like, nah, son, like you ain't you ain't from here. We appreciate your work, but we don't need you, need you. Like, does that matter to you? The fact that these are CEO, you talked about like young people mm -hmm. on campus, but what about adults who are in that space but not of that space? Well, you know, we here we go. A, a lot of talking heads again. A lot of poor people talking about money. That's always that's <laughs> always the other thing. Like, I need a poor we're gonna, we're gonna <laughs> talk to we're gonna let that. poor people analyze money for us, right? The OG speaks, and when the OG says what the OG says, the OG says it. I knew that was coming. Oh, good. Like I'm not surprised. Like I because because some people might hear and be like, "Yo, son, just said yes." That's she said what she said, and she meant it, and she will likely say it again. So don't be surprised. And they want you to run behind dollars, right? What? Oh, he got money. He going whatever to you. Mm. But you know what? I'm building my life on a lot of tenacity. Like I, like, like these people who you talk about, Third Good Marshall mm. and all the esteemed alum that we can just roll off of our tongues. Money wasn't the focus. Mm. Mm. That's very true. It wasn't. It was not the focus, and it can't be the focus because you know why? No matter what we get, I will tell you, I sat with those guys who opened, who bought the Waldorf Astoria in Washington, D.C., Morehouse graduate. Mm -hmm. Rich. Flex. Plenty money. Flex. But let me just tell you something. 
our HBCU connection, our cultural connection was the reason that he extended the olive branch to me. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. We have never been able to build because, oh, the resources are there. We've never had the resources and we'll never have as much as them. We so, the argument, so we can't let that be the focus. So that argument it doesn't really to hold me, a lot of water it falls to flat for me. It falls flat for me because I'm also looking at somebody most of the time who doesn't even understand like what they're talking about. Like, I don't talk about money with people. I don't even have to discuss what I have or any of that. But the reality is most of these people were on the internet talking. Come on now. Yeah. That's, I mean, you're not even qualified. They are for, totally trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents. If that. If that. I think that that's a really interesting point. And, and one that I hadn't considered. But I do think, and this is something that we see all the time, there are a lot of people who just are not qualified to make, to weigh into that discussion. Well, that is that is the foundation of social media. There like, we go. You the majority of people qualified. who talk are not qualified to speak. And about. I think if we took out or we separated the numbers of people who weren't qualified to weigh in on this conversation from any angle, mm -hmm. you're talking about HBC, HBCU athletics, not only did you not go to an HBCU, but you're not athletic. And you don't know anything <laughs> oh, about that. Right? right. So there's that, right? You're talking about HBCU, higher education, administration. Not only did you not go to an HBCU, but you don't know the ins and outs. And I'm speaking as a former Howard University Board of Trustee member, like real talk, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't understand the complexities of what it is to actually run a university and the intricacies of it. And yet you want to publicly sort of have this commentary about what HBCU should and should not do. Lambast is what they do. From Appalachian State. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, so there's so there's that part, right? Like, at a certain point, I feel like it is a family discussion. Yeah. And know your place. Yeah. Like, know your lane. Maybe if you get a chance to sit in the room, you should appreciate the fact that you have that opportunity mm -hmm. to be a fly on the wall and you're not getting kicked out the room because you're yeah. a cousin. But understand that your place may not necessarily be with the microphone telling us, HBCU alums, how and what should be done and the way to do it. I, I want to say this. We do also have to be careful with silencing justified questions or points made that could benefit us that may come from outsiders. Even though I know it's sort of like, I could talk about my sister, but you can't talk about my sister. Right. I get it. Where you do that Where matters. Where you do that though. matters. But here's the, here's the thing, particularly with HBCU athletics. And I can speak on this as a former college athlete. Right. And transferring into Howard, right? Um, I know firsthand that, well, particularly with Howard, because that that's not our, our lane, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, the athletic department is a shit show. It was. It's gotten a lot better. Sure. But it was a shit show. And and anybody who's been involved with athletics in HBCU experience. will tell you, like, it's always a shit show. So a lot of stuff that's happened, like, with Dion and then with Ed Reed, a lot of folks are like, mm, kind of not surprised. But in true form, we kind of, like, had these conversations intimately. We wasn't taking it. We wasn't using Twitter or Facebook or Instagram as a soundboard to kind of air it out, but we kind of saw it happening. This advancement in HBCU athletics is very new, particularly for yeah. schools that are not of the South South. Like yeah. the Southern schools, they've been on it. Yeah. The Gremlins, the Texas, yeah. they, they've been on it. In fact, they've been on it. They've been like, but for Howard's, the Hamptons, Dell State, all of them, this is very new. The idea of like, let's attract the top, whatever, that's new. So unfortunately... The world is watching us figure this out as we go along. As we go along. Going yeah. publicly is yeah. very much so difficult. Yeah. Hillary, I'm yeah. gonna give you the last word before we close out on this one. Well since you've you've talked about like poor people, you've talked about <laughs> oh, like gosh. unqualified well, so people. I, I did want to interject and just say that I think Deion Sanders and Ed Reed are very much so two different animals. Mm. Okay. How Ed so? Reed came unglued. He, he was not, to me, he proved that he is not, he was not the right leader for the job. I mean, you, you're going to take on all of these black men who actually need a true leader, somebody whose footing is, is firmly planted in a lot of different spaces mm -hmm. to grow them, like, in ways that a lot of them may have never been exposed to. And for him to come on TV and come unglued like that, we have to vet our leadership just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And I get exactly what you said. I was going to speak to the fact that it's very difficult to grow publicly because systems are not something that we thrive in. 
creating systemic things is not our lane. Mm-hmm. That's something that we're having to like. We uh, are used to adapting with yes, systems rather absolutely. than creating systems. Yes. So now we're creating our own and it's very difficult. So I think that there should be, you know, some grace in some ways. Well, here's what I got to say as we close out. I want to see that same energy for anybody who had smoke about HBCUs and what they should be doing. Mm-hmm. Show me where you've written a check. Show me where mm-hmm. the receipts are. I don't want to hear what you have to say if you're not willing to be part of the solution because to Hillary's point, there are a lot of people who are about the critique, but not about that work. 